I'm not going to go too much into, into any details in terms of the previous um, uh, presenters went into in terms of offering solutions because we, we're basically a, um, a production company who produce uh, CNC, IM and 3D printed parts across lots of different industries. Uh, but what I want to talk about is our experience of, of what does Industry 4.0 mean to us and, and what makes us a digital manufacturer. Um, in terms of uh, uh, where we are and what we do, we're based in, uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, in Europe, our uh, uh, main part of our business uh, is based in Telford, just down in Shropshire. And what we do is, uh, I mean, uh, the whole basis of, of when we started the company um, back in 99, which is in the States, uh, was really uh, a frustration of traditional manufacturing methods and why things take so long, particularly in injection molding. And our founder, our founder wanted to create a company that would help companies accelerate this product development right at the very beginning. So rather than looking at just at what we can do as a factory to make the factory smart, which we do have smart factories now, uh, we have about nine factories uh, across the world, um, but also reducing that uh, development time, reducing that risk for our customers as it goes through. So by being a digital manufacturer, uh, allowing more and more projects to go through, which is a, which is a key part, uh, we think, uh, from a, uh, a digital or from Industry 4.0. <coughs> and the way that um, I think the industry is evolving a, a, a lot since um, our uh, launch within Europe in 2005, uh, so uh, this year it will be 13 years, it's, uh, we're, we're a very young company, uh, we started off literally with two men and his dog and a couple of in injection molding machines um, in, uh, uh, in Telford. Uh, we now have over 500 uh, people, probably about 350 of those, actually working in production, which is great. And we've had, we've had, good, um, uh, we've had good success and growth over the, those years, and particularly over the last three to five years, we've had a good, good growth. Um, so how's that evolving for us? Where does that fit in? We've all seen the, uh, 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 the diagrams about uh, the Industrial Revolution and how we moved through to that, and getting through to um, the fourth uh, revolution in digitizing uh, what we do. And like I said in the beginning, the, the, the whole aim was trying to digitize the front end of manufacturing um, and unlocking that. Uh, what is, intent to all intents and purposes, can be a very long uh, iterative, pro iterative, iterative process. Um, designing and redesigning. Um, so what we looked at right at the front was uh, digitizing and automating uh, the analysis of CAD as it was uploaded. And to do majority, probably about 80% of that uh, of uh, parts could be uh, automatically uh, analyzed for uh, tool pathing um, and also for uh, mold flow analysis and to give that, that give that information back to the customer very, very quickly, um, and in most cases within two hours. So shortening that development time is a key part of, of, of uh, being a digital manufacturer within uh, uh, Industry 4.0. And initially, we started off with a prototyping company, but that also goes to on-demand or production parts, um, making sure that you speed up that process, give the information back um, to, the, to the customer so that the process can be speeded up, reducing the risk of having parts delivered that don't actually work. Because um, the, the, we're, we're not a design company, we're a manufacturing company. Um, we don't take uh, responsibility for the actual design itself. We, we work with clients on that across all industries, including aerospace and automotive. There are three mega trends which um, really drive what we do, what we've done so far, and what we're moving forward with. Um, shortening the product life cycles is really key to us because, and it's really interesting hearing uh, all of the different solutions from Schneider and from everybody else. And we've worked with, with various different companies across the years. And although we're, we're a digital manufacturer and we, we promote that widely uh, uh, across the business, um, we have a lot of uh, areas in terms of uh, automation and gathering data which we can improve on. Uh, and that's where we're looking at in terms of shortening those. Uh, uh, product life cycles from a design perspective, but also from a production perspective. We also have uh, 
right at this moment, probably one of the fastest um, uh, uh, life cycles in terms of getting uh, a mold tool through production. We can do a very simple one within one day and get uh, uh, molds off that very, very quickly. But there's a lot of other efficiencies and a lot of other data that we can gather on our machines. And unlike uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, traditional long-standing businesses, we do have machines which are capable of data and we do capture lots of data to, to enable us to um, improve as we go along. And it was good to hear about, I can't remember which one it was, was talking about scalability. Um, standardization is, has been key for us to make us successful in what we do. So making sure that sometimes that, that makes us difficult to deal with because we say, okay, we, in order for us to do this quickly for you, repeated, repeatedly for you as well, so that you get a, a repeated quality, then we have certain standardization of, of how we do tools, design tools, uh, and how we manufacture parts. But it also means it's, it's very, very scalable. It, we, we can push through that and grow as we've done. We added from a CNC, we added another 35 machines this year um, uh, from Haas, and it was quite one of their biggest um, uh, orders uh, for CNC machines in one go. So we're continually trying to grow that way, but the only way we can do that is, is those two areas. So consider that if, you know, when you're going through, we, meant, we heard about scalability, but standardization and making sure that you understand what your end goal is, that's been really key for us, because we had that. We wanted to be uh, a company that could work with, in partnership with customers and make sure we push that forward. Um, of course, we've, we've, we've heard about the Internet of Things, um, expanding into new markets, uh, and we know it's an engine for growth uh, in moving forward. Um, and I think he's mentioned before, 25 billion IoT devices by 2019. So there's, there's, there's a lot of scope for expansion. Uh, and we've got a, 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 an exciting um, program, and hence uh, uh, my title, Special Operations Manager, it's, it, it's new into the UK. And we're trying to expand what we do in terms of anything outside our standard or standardized services to enable us to uh, uh, incorporate some of this technology so that we can, we can speed up things even quicker. Um, I won't go into too many details of those, but 75% of new cars will have built-in IT connectivity by 2020, and 60% of global manufacturers use data recorded from connected devices, which is, you know, I, I, we know which way it's going, and we know that there are a lot of SMEs who are struggling to, to meet that, and we work across the board with uh, a lot of our customer bases SMEs because we can provide them with uh, the scalability, the range of types of services, to enable them to do things a lot quicker, which it isn't, a, a, as the last speaker said, it isn't a quick road to introduce this. We're very fortunate because we were designed that way as an organization right from the very beginning. Um, but it's not always the case uh, for that. I was at a seminar last year, uh, a local one, um, hosted by a company, an engineering company, they're, they're in the automotive industry, and one of their directors stood up and said, um, you know, yeah, we want to be a digital company. What is it? Because they didn't know, uh, and they, don't, they didn't know how to apply it. So all of these experts here, that's what they're looking for, those sort of guys to, to move that forward. Um, and, and the third one is, is personalization and mass customization. And I, I'll lead on to the, uh, the case study that we have, uh, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, but the way that works uh, in terms of us, it's very, very suitable for 3D printing, of course. A uh, 600 billion uh, market over the next five years in sectors of retail, healthcare, finance services. We've seen an explosion in uh, medical applications, um, and, and hence the, uh, the case study which I'll speak about here as well. But they, they create, specifically for us as well, they've created new revenue streams and customer retention and competitive differentiation. Um, 3D printing in Europe on the uh, standard. Uh, white material, uh, run of the mill, it is a very, very competitive market. Um, so we specialize, we have industrial 3D printing, so we, we specialize on, on specific markets like medical, aerospace, and automotive. Um, uh, we don't stick to the kind of standard, uh, uh, standard uh, volume product on that. So the, the challenge facing companies today it's consistent, consistent growing revenues and earnings 
um, in this dynamic landscape? How do you, how do you actually increase that? Um, well, making uh, innovation and product development and efficiencies internal is one key, key area. And we've identified that. We do, uh, we're a very efficient digital company, but there's still areas where um, I mentioned we've got over 350 people working in, in production, which is great and it's fantastic, but actually we are very he heavily reliant on, on manpower. And we don't automate a lot of this. We have a lot of variation. We don't have um, uh, 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 serial production and large volumes. We have lots and lots of different variations from lots of companies. Sub 10,000 uh, kind of volumes from different companies themselves. So there's a, there's a big area uh, for that as well. So yeah, uh, that's just uh, something on there, just in terms of we're more than just prototyping, but I won't go into that. I'll go straight into the, um, uh, the case study. Now the case study, uh, Novax DMA, they're a uh, South American based company, hence you can see the uh, title underneath there. They, um, like many other medical companies, um, uh, providing uh, medical uh, prosthetics or, or uh, implants, should I say, um, they done a lot of work and we've done quite a bit of work on uh, joint implants for them, both for uh, human use and for, for animal use as well, so canine implants. But they had this particular uh, customer, um, uh, this, this particular hospital which were looking at cranial implants, uh, and they didn't have any of their internal uh, design capability uh, to look at this. They knew what they wanted to do. And the challenge was, uh, you can see this uh, uh, malformed uh, skull. This is a, a digital image of, of the skull itself. Um, and they needed to uh, design a plate that uh, I think everybody knows that putting a solid plate in, in somebody's head, specifically in a hot country uh, where you've got sunshine isn't very good, and equally when it's very, very cold. Um, so they came to us. Uh, we have a, a 3D printing metal facility, uh, which is uh, DMLS, uh, direct metal laser sintering. And so basically, we can make uh, out of stainless steel, um, out of aluminium, or out of, in this case, titanium. Um, and we also have the ISO standards to, uh, uh, for use uh, within implants. And that involves a three-step cleaning process. And I'll come to that uh, more on that when we look at it. So here's just a, a, a section of that with some of the original work. And they came to us with the, okay, we need to, we need to have a, a cranial implant which will cover this particular area within uh, uh, this patient's head. But we need to work on uh, something that will be light enough, which will uh, uh, adapt and uh, enable um, uh, uh, growth around the area as well, so, um, uh, and, and not conduct heat. Uh, so, the solution to that uh, was this, and it's a, uh, uh, it's a matrix, I've got a larger picture than that, but you can see how it fixes on to uh, the skull itself. Uh, this was developed internally by our, uh, although we, when we don't have a design house, on specific structures, uh, we do have a design resource in, internally. And you can see there, so it's like a, 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 a matrix or mesh and overlaid, uh, and there's probably about, uh, if, if you talk about layers, there's probably two or three layers. Um, we do down, it's down to about 20 micron on that. So this allows the tissue growth around and into, and it also allows the, um, uh, uh, the uh, dissipation of heat, and of course, when it gets too cold as well, uh, it works that way. The, the main advantage of uh, using the, our in-house design software was the ability, although the project for this particular one took longer than normal because we got involved with some of the design work, it was around about six weeks um, of intensive work in, in getting this, this correct. The main issue is we're dealing with a uh, um, with titanium powder uh, in DMLS. So once you've finished sintering that, you've got to make sure all of all of the material you're able to get rid of every bit of material because you don't want to put um, any particles uh, when you're actually uh, putting it uh, into the skull. So that was part of the the design process on that. Uh, now we have uh, perfected this particular. Uh, process and, and this particular matrix, um, we've repeated that time and time again for different patients as well um, onto that. I'm going to show you some images now. If anybody's squeamish, just look away. 
Um, it should, hopefully it shouldn't be too close, but it is a big screen anyway. Uh, but it just shows on here um, the, um, uh, the surgeons here installing uh, the cranial implant. So this is uh, images from the, the hospital itself. And then they uh, fix it uh, with titanium uh, fixings into the skull itself. And then obviously the, um, uh, the skin goes back over the top. Uh, and it worked very, very, very well. So what we do is we make the parts. Um, uh, what happens now, um, customer uploads his parts to, uh, digitally to us. Uh, it is uh, checked uh, for uh, design for manufacture and making sure for 3D printing, it doesn't really matter what the structure is because obviously, obviously you can, you can uh, make things which you can't make in any other uh, type of manufacturing process. Um, but it does matter about the orientation of the part um, to make sure the structure comes out uh, to, the, to uh, what's needed to fit into, uh, into that. Then it goes through the three-stage cleaning process. Then it goes through to the hospital to be then prepared for the operation. Um, so that's how it goes through. This is one of the, the areas which is specialist, the, the, the real specialist area which we, we uh, are involved with. The rest of it is, is really based around uh, uh, our IM business, which is probably the biggest part. Um, and you'll see, because we're here, uh, all the different kind of parts that we do manufacture, uh, and everything from automotive to the electrical industry as well. But that just gives you a flavor of, of that. Wh why, how has that helped us in terms of the um, rapid manufacturing? Now, th this gives uh, uh, just a flavor of uh, the rapid manufacturing versus traditional manufacturing. And as you can see, between the uh, initial prototypes and the iterations, we've reduced that down to about four weeks um, rather than, than three months. Uh, and that's all to do with the kind of uh, software, and it is proprietary, we've written that software internally. Um, so right from the very beginning, we uh, employed very, very smart software engineers, and we still have. We have a big development team uh, developing what we do across all the services, including 3D printing, uh, so that we can reduce that down. The engineering build uh, and, uh, uh, and going through uh, certain certifications, again, takes about the same period, but we've reduced that down to about six months. If we're talking about um, injection molding, that's even, that's even shorter. You, you're talking from uh, 12 weeks down to even uh, two or three weeks uh, to get that down. So employing uh, these and the future of what we're, we're looking at um, and improving our efficiencies and gathering more data and, and even uh, automating further is something that will improve this a little bit further as well. So it's really important um, like I said at the beginning, we were fortunate because this is, this is how the company was formed. And it was formed by our founder, who is a software engineer. Um, uh, he just happened to be building uh, some product which needed injection molding. Um, you can apply that to businesses that stand today, but you just have to relook at, uh, at how that pushes forward. And what is your uh, end goal? For us, it was to make it easier for uh, companies to uh, push their projects through the development process earlier reduce that risk as well. And I think, okay, just a little bit of history about us just before I finish this at the end. Uh, we started as ProtoMold, I think I mentioned, um, uh, we started injection molding um, back in, in 99 when the company was launched. Um, we then uh, acquired First Cut, which is CNC machining. So we applied the same uh, machine learning on that and we have the same kind of software and set up for DFM, so you upload a, a CAD, you get, within a couple of hours, you get back a 3D um, um, uh, a quote back, which gives you all of the, the kind of data that you need. Uh, we acquired Fineline, which is 3D printing, so that's our, uh, um, our most recent uh, service. And then we changed to Proto Labs as the, as the company we are today. As we move forward, um, our next venture, which has only just happened in, in the US at the moment, is uh, metal fabrication, so sheet metal fabrication. Again, that's Rapid. Rapid is the company we've required on that, and that just moves us forward uh, as we go through. The whole ethos of this is why have we acquired and moved forward is because that's what our customers have asked us for. Um, and the majority of our larger customers have all of these in-house. 
um, but they don't have the uh, uh, capability in terms of, of uh, the range of different kind of services um, and the ability to uh, deliver that day after day after day uh, because of the capacity as well. And that's me finished. Thank you very much. Thank you.